Hello New Zealand again and welcome to another episode of Wreck and Roll. My name is Mark Pacey from the Wired Up Archive and I'm taking you through four more shipwreck stories today. Hope you're enjoying your Labour weekend. Those of you who are lucky enough to have the day off, I do, but I thought I'd come in specially to keep this show going for you. So we're starting off today with number 25. We'll get straight into it. Oh, where are we? This is the story of Canterbury. Canterbury was a 37-ton schooner and first appears in our paper in 1855, sailing out of Akaroa and Wellington. In July of 1860, John Grubb advertised for sale two-thirds of the schooner Canterbury. She was described as being able to carry a good cargo, having a light draft, lots of room for passengers and cargo, and having a good supply of sails and anchors. Four years later, the Canterbury, under Captain Olgivy, I haven't read this for a while, yep, so yeah, four years later, under the Canterbury, under Captain Olgivy, left Wellington for Napier with a cargo of rum, beer, bacon, and a piano. When nearing her destination, a strong wind rose up, and once the wind had died down, the Canterbury found herself in the Bay of Plenty. She then had to double back to make her intended port of call. On 6th of August, Canterbury sailed from Napier for the return trip to Wellington. By 13th of August, she was in Palliser Bay. From here, it is unclear what happened next, as the newspaper reports were vague. What is known is that while she was in Palliser Bay, she ran into trouble, and by 6pm had run aground. She was lucky to have come ashore on a sandy beach, free from rocks, and she suffered little damage. The crew disembarked safely, but did not need to worry about the cargo. The Canterbury was only carrying ballast. The weather was not too rough, so there was still hope that she could be recovered. On the 22nd of August, the SS Queen arrived at Port Chalmers and reported seeing the Canterbury on the beach in Palliser Bay. She also relayed that the weather was starting to turn in the area, with a strong southeasterly wind causing rough seas, which threatened the Canterbury's survival. If weather like that continued, there would be little hope of the attempts which were being made to take her off proving successful. Several attempts were made to try and refloat her, but they were unsuccessful. Ironically, within months of the Palliser Bay stranding, another vessel, also a schooner named Canterbury, was wrecked in Littleton Harbour. After lying stranded on the beach for several more weeks, the Palliser Bay Canterbury got a second chance at life. She was hauled further up the beach and her damage was repaired. She was then launched into Lake Ornoki, where she remained for several months. On the 19th of June 1865, the river mouth opened and the Canterbury sailed out of the lake and into the sea for the first time in 11 months. From here she went south and made port at Wellington. Around the same time, the other wrecked Canterbury was also raised, and both were given a chance to be reborn. Fairly short story, I know, but uh, still a good one. I'm now going to play you a piece of music. Now, this is actually one of the oldest songs that I'm going to play for you. This song came out 1924, if YouTube is correct. This is Ernest V. Stoneman, and the track is called Titanic. You seem to be having some technical difficulties there. I can't hear a thing on my end. I'll just try something first. All right, we'll try that one again.
No, it's choosing to be difficult. I'm not getting much. My illness always happens when I'm here on my own. So, unfortunately, I don't think we'll be playing any music for you today. Horrible thing that it's been. So we'll just go straight back into playing or reading you some more of these. And now I seem to have lost my video feed as well. It's going to be one of those days, isn't it? Okay, I seem to be back now looking at my video screen. Right, so... Do we dare try and play the music again? Maybe we will. Let's see what happens. I am getting absolutely nothing my end. I apologize if you're getting it, but I, I can't hear a thing through my monitors, which tells me that the music is not going through. So I'm sorry, no music today. Uh, maybe the next time we will play twice as much music and make up for the mistakes there. So we will go straight on. Number 26, this is the story of the Midas. The Midas was a 26-ton schooner belonging to Captain John Combin. She, did. she provided passage for passengers and cargo around the New Zealand coast with advertisements appearing in the papers for her services in 1865. In March of 1865, the Midas returned from what was very accurately described as a unprofitable voyage. She had been sailing from Kaiapoi on a journey north. After nine days at sea, she had, adv had hardly advanced along she had hardly advanced far along the South Island coast due to the foul weather. All she had to show for this Herculean effort were the lost sails and damaged rigging. On the 1st of September, the Midas sailed from Dunedin for Hokitika with a general cargo. The trip was going well until she approached Cook Strait. The winds changed for the worst and a gale rose up from the southeast. The seas were rough and the winds were strong. It was impossible to pass through the straits, so the Midas headed north instead. One week after leaving port, they were off the coast of Wairarapa, still being forced north by the powerful winds. At mid as midnight approached, the whites of the breaking waves of the shore could be seen from the deck of them. The Midas was heading straight for the rocks off the coast of Flat Point. To avoid grounding, both sails were raised to try and keep the Midas out in deeper water. The result was the unrelenting wind not only ripped the sails off, but took the masts and the bowsprit with them too. The Midas was now at the mercy of the weather, and the rocks were fast approaching. The anchor was dropped in an attempt to prevent a grounding. The depth of the water was now just nine metres. At 2 a.m. the anchor gave way and the Midas struck a reef. There was little in the way of light and the crew and passengers decided to remain on board and spend a few uncomfortable hours on the stricken vessel. They were still clinging to the deck as morning broke, but the deck was no longer attached to the rest of the Midas. It had come loose during the night and was now floating towards the shore, while the rest of the Midas was a short distance away. By staying on this unusual life raft, they were able to scramble onto nearby rocks and from there onto the shore. In the process, Captain McTaggart was badly injured. The place they had come ashore was devoid of inhabitants. It wasn't until the following day they were visited by Māori, who provided help and supplies. After a few more days camping at the, on the beach and with no other visitors, the Midas crew realised they would have to go and help for themselves. They began the slow journey to Wellington on foot. Captain McTaggart remained at Flat Point, as he was still too unwell to make the full journey. One of the first reports of her loss was very vague. The schooner Midas belonging to this port is reported to have been wrecked on the North Island. Crew saved. 
A few days later, the crew from the Midas reached Wellington and the rest of the story got out. In the reports, it was said there were four crew and three passengers as well as Captain Taggart, who was still at the Flat Point station. The Midas crew in Wellington were then able to obtain a ride in the three-masted schooner Stormbird the rest of the way to Hokitika. By this stage, the Midas was just about completely destroyed by the elements. Number 27, this is the story of Triton. The Triton was a brigantine, although sometimes described as a schooner, of 140 tonnes. She operated out of Australia and is first mentioned visiting New Zealand in March of 1862. The following year she was operating a service from Newcastle, transporting coal to this country, a service she maintained for the next few years. Although coal was being mined in New Zealand as early as 1840, the production could not keep up with the demand and the remainder had to be imported. A report in April of 1865 detailed the route that Triton took after sailing out of Newcastle. She first made for the Three Kings Islands and from there onto the Hen and Chickens Islands before continuing on to New Zealand, berthing at Otago. On this particular journey she brought with her 171 tonnes of coal. The Triton left Otago for a return trip on the 4th of June 1866. Not long after leaving port she ran into rough weather. Captain Robert Spence tried to head south to avoid it, but the weather made this impossible. He then tried to pass through Cook Strait, first sailing into Palliser Bay. He described what happened next. The current set round the cape into the bight. It was coming on a heavy gale from the southeast with a very heavy sea running. The schooner could not work against it. They tried all that men could do, but it was no use. And as a last resource, let go both anchors, but they parted like thread. The weather the Triton was experiencing was severe. Strong winds, heavy seas, thunder and lightning and torrents of rain made the experience of being on the brigantine very difficult. The Triton was now being forced into the shore by the winds and the current. A grounding was inevitable. As she neared the shore, the breaking surf forced her over. Her masts snapped and the crew found themselves thrown into the rough seas. By sheer force of will, every crewman made it as safely to shore. Because of the speed at which everything happened, nothing was saved. The crew only had the clothes on their backs, which were now sodden and cold from their dangerous swim. Looking back out to sea, they watched as their vessel was pounded by an angry sea. A mere five minutes after capsizing, the Triton broke up into pieces. The vessel had come to ground near the home of Mr. Matthews. While the crew accepted an offer from the owner to rest at his home, Spence borrowed a horse and made the trek to Wellington to relay what had happened. After a period of rest, the remainder of the Triton crew began the slow walk south to Wellington. They made it to the Pencarrow Lighthouse, which had been built just seven years previous, and stayed there for a rest. After hoisting colours to try and signal for help and not receiving any, they continued their voyage. Further along their journey they were passed by Peter Lang in a horse bus, who stopped to pick them up. Not only did he give them a ride, but also upon hearing their story, gave them some money to help them on their way. After arriving in Wellington, Mr. Ra Mr. Lang arranged a collection which raised a tidy sum for the men. It eventually totaled £16. Captain Spence had also arranged that there would be, they would be paid their full wages for the voyage. For the men that had lost everything, the generous actions of members of the community and a considerate captain went a long way to help them get back on their feet again. Right, we're up to our last one already. It's going to be a short show today, considering I'm having issues with my music. This is the P.S. Cleopatra. 
The paddle steamer P.S. Cleopatra was built in 1863 in Onehanga for a cost of £800. She was 100 feet long and had a measured speed of just over 6 knots. Used as a supply ship, she was initially working up and down the Waikato River. Later upgrades expanded her role to ferrying passengers as well. She was sold in September of 1867 to Joseph Paul and she shifted to the port of Nelson where she was taken for, sea tr for a sea trial with 50 guests. Despite running into some rain showers the trip was a success and her new owners were optimistic about her future capabilities. One characteristic that made her unique was her small draft which meant she could traverse up some of the smallest rivers. This would be useful as some of the rivers that were marked as being possible gold mining sites hadn't been started due to the difficulty of getting supplies upriver to the miners. P.S. Cleopatra began her new life in November and sailed from her home port of Nelson on her way to the Thames gold fields. The trip went well until she was off the coast of Castle Point when she experienced a heavy gale. She managed to steam through it and arrived in Napier on the 10th of November. Taking on coal for the rest of the trip, she stayed in port for a few days before sailing north. This would be her life for the next several months, shipping cargo up and down the east coast. She also made special trips for passengers. In 1868 she made a special excursion leaving Napier on the 13th of January and sailing to Wairoa, where she steamed up the Wairoa River and dropped off her passengers in time for the Wairoa races. She sailed back two days later. The three-day trip costing each passenger one pound. Two months later P.S. Cleopatra ran into trouble running aground at Poverty Bay. She was able to be refloated and made for Napier. Finding repairs could not be made at Napier, P.S. Cleopatra's captain Abraham Palmer made the decision to sail for Wellington, leaving on the 2nd of April. It would be a tragic decision. Just 20 kilometres south of Napier, P.S. Cleopatra ran into heavy seas and was forced to hug the coast by Cape, by Cape Kidnappers, where she anchored to wait out the storm. She sailed again after the weather had died down and had nearly made her destination when she hit more heavy seas, this time off the coast of Cape Palliser. P.S. Cleopatra was designed to sail up rivers and did not perform well in a storm. The coal was almost used up trying to keep the vessel on course, and she was beginning to take on water. The pumps could not be manned as all the crew were fully occupied keeping her on course. Recognising that he was in a losing battle, Captain Palmer made the decision to ground his ship. At 7.30pm on Sunday the 5th of April, P.S. Cleopatra beached near White Rock. All the crew survived, but they were only able to save a few items of clothing before having to abandon the ship due to the weather. During the night the seas pounded the P.S. Cleopatra, and by morning she had been broken into two. Within days she was reduced to smaller pieces of wreckage which were strewn along the beach. With her remains disappearing, she was quickly put to action. No, she wasn't. That would be a neat trick. She was quickly put to auction and was sold just over a week later to Rutledge, Kenny and Company of Napier. Captain Palmer and his officers were ordered to take part in a court of inquiry over the stranding. After some deliberation, the court's decision was unanimous. No blame would be attached to Captain Palmer or his crew as they had acted under very trying circumstances to the best of their knowledge and ability. Right, that's it. So we are, we're actually 10 minutes under time, but that would have been my music filling in that gap nicely. So again, we'll finish off as we always do with a fantastically brilliant joke. This one is no exception. I saw a chap managing to juggle 20 rowing implements. Really? Yes, it was awe-inspiring. 
All right, so that's it for me today. I will catch up with you again next week. Hopefully by then we'll have some more music for you. I'll see if I can squeeze in the other couple of tracks I was going to play today, or at least one of them. I think you're all hanging out to hear Mr. Ernest V. Stoneman's uh, song. We will try and fit that in for you next time. So until next Monday, we will, I guess we'll see you then. Um, Have a good week and look after yourselves.